Um, want to uh, turn our attention to God's Word this morning, you know, and uh, you know that I am a transparent person, and um, I, I hope you've seen that so far in me as I've, as I've brought God's Word. Well, you know, there are some times as a preacher when we come to text, and we know that this is going to be a compelling, it's going to be a convicting text, and it's... Um, how do you put it? It's easy to preach. Those of you who preach understand that. There are other times where you go to a text and you kind of have to scratch your head a little bit. Um, and uh, this week's text, to be honest with you, I spent hours in it, a lot of time studying it. Um, but I, I came away thinking, man, it's, it wasn't as uh, compelling or as easy to preach as other texts have been, like last week's as we talked about the tongue. And yet I was reminded in this, this morning as I spent time in the pastor's study praying and preparing, I was reminded of the very verse that you heard read earlier, that, that God, God's word will not return void. And when, I, when we met beforehand, before the service, and it was shared with me that that's, that verse had also been uh, laid on his heart that he was going to share, I was like, okay, God. Um, you are already a step ahead of us on this. And so we're going to be opening a passage that, that I promise you probably won't be as exciting as the tongue passage was. Um, but you know what? We are faithfully going through the book of James, and we are not going to skip verses, and we're not going to go over, skip over passages. Um, so with that said, we're going we're to turn once again uh, to God's Word. As a way of introduction, let me tell you about a man named Thomas Young. Thomas was known as the last person who knew everything. Okay, teenagers, in case you think you know everything, I did, I did know everything as a teenager. Um, uh, the fact is, we actually don't know everything, but Thomas Young, he was known as the last person who knew everything. In the 18th century, Britain was a polymath, meaning a person whose knowledge spans a substantial number of subjects, using complex amounts of knowledge to solve specific problems. As a child, Thomas was precociously talented. By the age of 13, he had read 30 chapters of the book of Genesis in Hebrew, a language he taught himself. In 1801, he had been appointed to a professorship of natural philosophy at the Royal Institution, where he delivered as many as 60 lectures in a year. In 1808, he completed his medical training at the University of Cambridge and set up a practice as a physician in London. Young's skill, however, as a physician did not equal his skill as a scholar of natural philosophy or linguistics. His opinions were sought in many areas, such as the introduction of gas lighting to London and methods of ship construction. In physics, he had the boldness to contradict Sir Isaac Newton and propose a wave theory of light. In physiology, he made significant advances in understanding the mechanisms of the eye, explaining how it focuses and defining astigmatism. Egyptologists hail Young as one of the founders of their science. He provided key insights into deciphering the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs on the Rosetta Stone. In medicine, he was a distinguished physician. In music, he invented a technique for tuning keyboard instruments. Are you starting to get a picture? The last man that truly knew everything, this Thomas Young, was one of the most versatile minds of the 19th century. You know, the world around us gives great praise to brilliant minds, brilliant minds like those of Thomas Young, Albert Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk, perhaps. But God says in 1 Corinthians 1.20 through the Apostle Paul, that he has made the wisdom of the world foolish. Wisdom, you see, in God's economy, is often diametrically opposed to the wisdom we so often applaud on this earth. Its definition is completely different. Godly wisdom is found in people and places that surprise us. It appears in ways we do not expect, and godly wisdom is personified through character traits that may startle you. This morning, as we continue in this series in the book of James, we're going to get a glimpse into two kinds of wisdom, one from above and another from below. 
In case you haven't been here over the past few weeks, we are moving our way through the book of James, and we've been studying this letter that was written by the Apostle James, the brother of Jesus, to churches and Christians in the first century who had fled Jerusalem, we read in Acts chapter 8, because of persecution that was going on. They had been dispersed into the regions of Judea and Samaria, therefore fulfilling Jesus' words in Acts 1.8 that they would be his witnesses in all Judea and Samaria. And so God took the trials, the struggles, the persecution they were facing and used it as an event to cause his purposes to be accomplished. And so they're out in these lands, in these regions around Jerusalem now. They're living and they are being Christians there in a time when it was unpopular to be a Christian. In a time when when your faith in Christ could cost you your freedom or in some cases your life. Facing these tribulations then, James encourages them to persevere in their faith and embrace the difficulties they faced as opportunities for God to develop in them and through them the righteousness and the traits that he desired in order that he might be glorified in the world around them. James addresses several behaviors in the book of James, several we have already addressed in this sermon series, behaviors that like a dam in a river block the flow of the development of godliness that we should see in our lives, that will prevent us from being transformed into the likeness of his son. Behaviors like human anger, behaviors like the temptation to show favoritism, behaviors like the sin of uncontrolled speech. And to his readers, both then and now, James says, the word of God implanted in you, we read, and it must not only be heard, but it must be enacted. James says, if your faith is real, if it's authentic, it will demonstrate itself through action. And this morning, just as James has insisted that belief without practice is a sham, that faith without works is dead, he's going to address the topic of wisdom and contend that wisdom without application is useless. And I want you to think whenever you hear wisdom, the wisdom of the Word of God. So in other words, if you hear the Word of God and you take it, but you don't apply it, then it does not become in your life wisdom. In other words, wisdom requires understanding and application to be married. What's more, James is going to flip our definition of wisdom on its head. Before we open that letter together, let's think for just a moment about the word wisdom in Scripture. The Greek word used in the New Testament and in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint, is the word Sophia. It means a capacity of the mind to not only retain knowledge, but to understand and apply knowledge. So you don't just have the smarts, you, you can take those smarts and apply them to your life. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5, the wise Solomon encourages us to get wisdom. And in chapter 16, verse 16, says that wisdom is better than gold. In Ecclesiastes 7, 23, 24, the same author Solomon acknowledges that getting wisdom is challenging. In fact, he writes of wisdom, who can find it? And in Matthew, Jesus himself differentiates between the foolish man and the wise man who build their foundations, their homes, their lives upon different foundations. And in James 1.5, Jesus' brother says, if anyone lacks wisdom, he should ask God for it. This week as I studied and I prayed in preparation for this morning, one of the very first things I was tempted to go to was was to steps for acquiring wisdom. And I thought, boy, would that preach. If we could talk this morning about how you attain the wisdom of God, I could say things to you like, in order to acquire God's wisdom, we need to fear God. That's scriptural. We need to desire wisdom, also scriptural. We need to pray for wisdom, and we need to study God's words. And I could have made a whole sermon out of those four points, And you probably would have walked away saying, that was a great sermon, but here's the problem. As I even began to outline those things, I was convicted that that's not James' reason for writing this passage. It's not James' central idea here. And so I found myself scratching those things off my notes all together in order to be faithful to the text. See, James is interested in overturning our definition of wisdom and encouraging us to find wisdom in places we normally would not look. 
He's more interested in showing us what wisdom looks like than telling us how to acquire it. So let's open our Bibles and read these six verses together. We are in James chapter 3, and we will read verses 13 through 18. And I'm reading to you from the English Standard Version of the Bible. James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. I want you to imagine America's most intelligent person for a moment. Let's set Thomas Young aside now and just imagine in the, the good old U.S. of A, who is it that might be the most intellectual person? What do you think they might do for a living? Are they examining a test tube in a laboratory somewhere? Gazing at a new electronic chalkboard full of equations? Perhaps they're leading a board meeting in a high-rise building well, you might be surprised to learn that none of these describes the actions of the man considered to be the smartest man in America today. Born into poverty and having a little, little formal education, horse rancher Christopher Michael Langan has an IQ of between 195 and 210 and often lays claim to being the smartest man in America. So when the author James begins verse 13 with, who is wise and understanding among you, if he were to say that to a population which include, includes Christopher Langan, perhaps he would raise his hand. After all, a high IQ and substantial amounts of knowledge are criterion for wisdom, are they not? And so as James opens this section, he's inviting those who think they might fall into this category to step up, to identify themselves if they dare those with degrees and high IQs, to those who think they are wise enough to be teachers, which James addressed just a few verses before, to the Jeopardy contestant want-to-bees, to the average person who's well convinced that he or she has life pretty well, or they understand life pretty well, and that they can give guidance and direction, James says, step forward. But those who too eagerly self-identify as wise find themselves the objects of unwanted scrutiny. For James isn't interested in standards and the ones we so frequently attach to wisdom. In fact, he suggests that there are two kinds of wisdom, the one we're familiar with and the one we should, as Christians, aspire toward. And they are very much dissimilar. If you're following along in your outlines that you may have received as you came in this morning, let's call the first type of wisdom a pseudo-wisdom. It is earthly, unspiritual, and disingenuous. To be pseudo-anything, to have that prefix attached to a word, means to be false, to be pretended, or to be unreal. The artificial wisdom James speaks of has the appearance of wisdom from human perspective, but it isn't really wisdom at all. I read this week of the U.S. Marshal Service's hunt for a man named Tommy Thompson, one of the most intelligent fugitives, the U.S. Marshal said, they had ever sought. Thompson, a treasure hunter turned con man, was arrested after two years on the run. Originally paid by investors to find a historic sunken treasure ship, which he did, and bring up the $50 million in gold that sunk with the vessel, which he also did, Thompson then took off with the treasure. He evaded capture for two years by keeping a low profile, by riding the bus and taxis to his destinations, paying cash for everything, and relying on a long-term accomplice. Was Thompson intelligent? Absolutely. 
But was he wise? No. You see, there's a difference. James says if anyone thinks he's wise and he's understanding, he should show it by his good works. In other words, wisdom is knowledge applied through good conduct. But pseudo-wisdom, well, perhaps full of knowledge, is void of such application. Pseudo-wisdom is earthly, James tells us in verse 15. It doesn't come from above. It's unspiritual, he goes on. It's not concerned with the things of God. It's even demonic, he writes, devilish and wicked, and it's disingenuous. It boasts and it lies to the truth, he says in the end of verse 14. There is perhaps no better picture of what I would refer to as pseudo-wisdom than what our culture today calls your truth. Those two words are so entrenched in our lexicon that we hardly recognize them for the incoherent nightmare that they are. Your truth can be different than my truth, the world says, and I have no right to declare your truth to not be truth. Among other things, the philosophy of your truth destroys families when suddenly a dad decides his truth is calling him to a new mate, a new family, or perhaps even a new gender. The idea that your truth can be different than my truth stands in absolute opposition to the absolute truth of God. We're watching as this popular Pseudo-wisdom unravels the very building blocks upon which our nation was built. Pseudo-wisdom is just that. It's artificial. It's pretend. It may have the appearance of wisdom, but not the substance. But James says there's another wisdom. We'll call it a righteousness-producing wisdom, if you will. This wisdom is heavenly. It's spiritual, and it is authenticated by actions. True wisdom bears fruit. Rather than leading to the unraveling of families and societies, true wisdom produces righteous results. That's what we read, actually, at the summary of this passage in verse 18, when James writes, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. See, when we live out this knowledge that we have received from the Word of God implanted in us, when we are doers and not just hearers of the Word, what we sow are not seeds of ungodliness, but instead seeds of righteousness, true wisdom. It takes what we receive from the Word of God and it puts it into action. True wisdom results in marriages and families staying together because the man and woman who made promises to each other are not only hearers of the word, but doers. True wisdom results in Christians who care for the poor because they take the words of Scripture seriously. True wisdom looks like churches who care for orphans, widows, and the homeless because they believe the word of God to be authoritative over their lives. The kind of wisdom James speaks of is heavenly as opposed to earthly. Its origins are from on high. It's spiritual rather than natural, and it's authenticated by actions. The proof of this wisdom is good conduct, says James. This wisdom is not empty knowledge. Rather, it's understanding applied to life in such a way as to bring about peace and righteousness. It's a wisdom that's quite different from the pseudo-wisdom espoused by the culture around us. It's not my truth. It's not your truth. It's a truth that comes from God. Anna Merlin, an American journalist and the author of the book Republic of Lies, American Conspiracy Theorist, devotes an entire chapter to the psychology behind UFO conspiracies. Now, if you are a big UFO follower, I'm sorry, I may step on your toes here. But here's what she writes. The intensity, depth, and breadth of the conversation about aliens throughout the world says something profound about human hopes, about our desire to not be alone in the universe, about, get this, our wish for some wise and mysterious force out there in the farthest reaches of space that is ready to show us the way. There's a sense, she says, that extraterrestrialists don't just exist, but that they will someday reveal to us a better way to live, a higher state of being. She quotes an astronomer who wrote, the UFO mystery holds a mirror to our own fantasies. 
It expresses our secret longings for a wisdom that might come down from the stars in new, improved, easy-to-use packaging to reveal the secrets of life and tell us at last who we are. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to testify to you this morning that we don't need to wait for extraterrestrial creatures to come down and show us the way. We don't need them to come and reveal a path of wisdom. We don't need other forms of life to tell us how to live. The almighty creator of all that is, of every star, of every planet, of every galaxy, descended from on high to show us the way. He became wisdom incarnate for us. And this morning, if you're among those who spend your time looking to the stars for wisdom, why not try meeting the maker of the stars? That's a message of good news. And it's a message the world needs to hear. It's a message that many have not heard before, but are in bad need of. Come back to the text with me. Now that we know the difference between these two types of wisdom and the sources of each, let's lean in and consider how exactly we begin to live in a wise manner, full of wisdom that is godly and produces righteousness. The first thing we see, I think, in this passage is that we need to rethink the appearance of wisdom. You see, authentic wisdom looks like meekness and humility. Listen again to the second part of verse 13. By his good conduct, James said, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. I had to dig into that phrase this week. What in the world is he talking about the meekness of wisdom? When you and I hear the word meek, we think of weakness. We think of timidity, of fearfulness. We develop a picture of someone who can't stand up for themselves. Maybe that kid on the playground who's always getting pushed around, and so they stand off to the side afraid to engage because they are too fearful. Well, Aristotle really defined this word. He wrote of the, this word meekness as being the middle ground between two extremes, getting angry without reason on one extreme and not getting angry at all on the other. Being meek, Aristotle argued, meant getting angry at the right time in the right measure for the right reason. It meant a condition of the heart and mind that demonstrates gentleness, not in weakness, but in power. James wants us to understand that a person who is truly wise in the way God wants us to be is gentle in a powerful way. We might substitute the word humility here for meekness in our contemporary vernacular. The wise man, James would insist, doesn't run around boasting that he is wise. The wise woman isn't all up in your face declaring that she knows what's best. The truly wise person has inward grace and focus on God that is powerful yet gentle. There is, of course, no better example of this meekness than our Savior, who grew, we're told, by the Gospels in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, who was provoked by the scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law and yet never once lashed out at them, who was ridiculed but never once lost his cool, who had the power of the universe at his disposal and yet submitted to death on a cross. His was the greatest of power under the greatest of control. His was perfect meekness. From him, we learn what true wisdom looks like. As we redefine wisdom, then we must also recommit ourselves to the characteristics of wisdom. James outlines eight of these characteristics in verse 17, some of which may actually surprise you. After all, if I were to ask you this morning for a list of characteristics, ways you would describe wisdom, you might use words like maturity, intelligence, perception, or discernment. But James' list doesn't include any of those words. Look at them with me. First, James wants us to understand that wisdom is demonstrated by purity, not evil. This characteristic doesn't come just first on the list, but the way it's listed in Greek, it comes in first priority on the list. The wisdom of God, wisdom that produces righteousness, expresses itself, first of all, through holiness that is contracted, uh, contrasted with the evil practices James has already spoken of in verse 16. The kind of wisdom James is describing is wisdom that leads people to do what is right. If you meet a Christian who's living a pure life, you see wisdom displayed. Second, James says that wisdom is expressed through peacefulness, 
I would suggest, rather than contentiousness. Nine years ago, I attended squadron officer school, which in the Air Force is a six-week course for captains. We were divided into flights of about 12 captains in each flight, and each of our flights had at least a couple of very high-performing captains, officers who really wanted to do well in school, wanted to do well in their careers. What was interesting, though, was that the more intelligent the captain, the more likely the captain was to cause dissension in the flight. Why? Because they were out, out for their own success and not that of the team. Over time, our flight gelled. We found peace. But I learned an important lesson during that course, that wisdom and intelligence are often not synonymous. And sometimes the most intelligent of men and women can lack wisdom and furthermore cause the greatest dissension, cause the greatest stress to a team or organization. James says, brothers and sisters in the church, that ought never to be so. The kind of wisdom that God provides expresses itself in peacefulness. So says James, if you think you're wise, but you cause disruption and you cause turmoil in the environments around you, think again. Third, righteousness producing wisdom is expressed through gentleness, not anger. The word for gentle means fair. It means equity. It means fitting. It means appropriate. It means to be suitable. Gentleness is not common, I would suggest, among Americans, not even among Christian Americans. The Greek literally means the opposite of insisting on one's rights. It's about being tolerant and courteous and yielding, not tolerant of sin, but having a a spirit about you that is gentle. It's a trait that is sorely lacking in our political and societal systems, and it's almost non-existent in our social media platforms. In a day and age when we value individual autonomy above all and the right to have our own opinions, gentleness flies in the face of cultural norms and says, yield to others, be courteous to others, Be tolerant. Don't become angry because someone is imposing on your rights. Are you looking for wisdom? You'll find it, says James, in one who's gentle and who's courteous. Fourth, this wisdom is expressed through teachability, not obstinance. James says it's open to reason. The word here is interesting. It's it's actually, it, it means to be easily persuaded. The word is used repeatedly in the book of Acts, I found as I studied, and it refers to a person who was persuaded by the truth. It means that a person is not hard-headed, but rather open to the constructive feedback of others, and most importantly, to the application of the word of God in their lives. Those who are truly wise in the way James describes have a teachable spirit about them. They're ready to listen to the Holy Spirit, whether it be through the preached Word of God, the taught Word of God, or through the counsel of the Word of God given by godly brothers and sisters. This wisdom is expressed in a teachable spirit rather than in a hard-headedness that refuses to learn from others. Fifth, James says this wisdom is displayed in mercy, not selfishness. James literally says it is full of mercy. I love the Greek definition of this. The word literally means it's stuffed with mercy. Don't you love that? True wisdom is stuffed with mercy. In this sense, mercy means compassion and kindness shown to those who are in need. In need, This kind of wisdom is full of compassion for others. It isn't evidenced by behaving as if you are a mercenary out for your own success and not that of others. No, this kind of righteousness producing wisdom has a heart that beats for those who are hurting. Do you want to find wisdom, James says? Well, I would suggest you go down town and look for those who are serving the homeless with no desire to be recognized. Do you want to find wisdom? Go to the slums of Calcutta, India, and see those who are caring for the lepers and the cripples. Go to the, or visit children's homes and look for those who give their lives to care for orphans. You see, wisdom is on display when the body of Christ places the needs of others above their own needs. Sixth, we're almost there. Sixth, righteousness producing wisdom is on display through benevolence, not bitter jealousy. 
James goes on to say that this wisdom is full, not only of mercy, but also of good fruits. The word fruit is used metaphorically by Jesus, you probably remember in the Gospels, to speak about actions, about deeds, and about conduct. And now Jesus' own brother picks up the same metaphor and says true wisdom is full of good deeds, like sweet fruit, fruit that tastes good as opposed to bitter jealousy that he's spoken of just verses before. If you spend your time envying, jealous of what others have, of of their positions in life, whether financially, relationally, or otherwise, you will miss out on the blessing of doing good deeds. True wisdom lives by the words of Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in. True wisdom is marked by good actions rather than by a comparison to others and a jealousy of those around you. Seventh, wisdom that comes from above is marked by impartiality, not bias. James has already addressed the topic of favoritism. We learned of that in chapter 2, and he's drilled down deeply into their and into our tendency to show preferential treatment to some over others. And now he draws out that concept once again and says, if you're looking for wisdom, you won't find it in those who show favoritism, but rather in those who show no partiality. And finally, he concludes this list of ways in which we can be emulating and asking God for wisdom by sincerity, not hypocrisy. That's how he finishes up. And the word here comes from two Greek words. They mean without pretending. Originally, this is interesting, it meant to be inexperienced in the art of acting. In the New Testament, it came to mean without hypocrisy, without pretense, unfeigned, genuine, real, true, sincere. And so if you want to find someone who's wise, look for someone who doesn't put on a show for you. Surround yourself with people who are authentic and without pretense, for only then will you find true godly wisdom. As we prepare to close this morning, I want to challenge you and myself to increase godliness and to lean forward in living out these traits. But, But I also want to be abundantly clear on something. Because I think the book of James can be mishandled, as can any scripture, but James in particular, because of its focus on, on, on actions and deeds, can be misapplied. It can be turned into a morality lesson. Just as you are unable, just as I am unable to tame my tongue, and you are unable to tame your tongue, so too we are unable to live lives characterized by wisdom. This is not a work that you can do. You can't just decide to be more wise. You and I in our own strength are useless in increasing our moral aptitude. In the end, no matter how hard we try, we will come up missing the mark over and again. And so what I'm asking you this week is not to just try a little harder. I'm not asking you to take that list home and say, boy, I'm going to be more benevolent. Boy, I'm going to be more gentle. But you know, that's the message that a lot of Christians take away when they read Scripture. We are convicted that we just need to just be a little better as Christians. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with good news for you this morning. You and I have already been sanctified. We've already been made holy by Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.10 says this, listen, we've been sanctified by the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Did you catch that? You've been made holy by the body of Jesus Christ. If you are a believer, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you've been made holy and pure once and for all. In God's eyes, my friends, you are already holy. There's nothing, nothing you can do to earn his love and nothing you can do to lose it. So don't for a moment think that these lessons are about you needing to to keep or to get your salvation. So what do we make of these traits then? And how do we apply a text like this and and texts that we've studied over the past several weeks? And why? Why do we even need to focus on them if we've already been made holy once and for all? Well, let me simply put it this way. You and I need to strive to be what we already are. 
We need to strive to be what we already are. If there's one piece of application and you want to write one thing down to take with you, this week I'd invite you to write those words down. We need to strive to be what we already are. You're, you, if you've accepted the death of Jesus Christ as payment for your sins, if you've entered into the life of Christ, you've been made holy in God's eyes once and from all. And from that moment, for the rest of our lives, we are to strive to be what God has already made us. We must reach for the reality already accomplished on our behalf. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 7.1 that we are to bring holiness to completion. Peter says in his first epistle, chapter 1, verse 16, that we must be holy for he is holy. And Jesus himself says in Matthew that we are to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. My friends, as we reach for wisdom that only God can provide, we do so not to acquire or to keep salvation but because we strive to be what God has already made us in Christ Jesus. We strive, in the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.18, to be transformed into his likeness, into his image. So this morning, if as you look into the mirror of God's word, you find yourself resembling pseudo-wisdom and lacking the traits that, that James identifies as characteristics of godly wisdom, I would suggest one of two things is true of you today. Number one, your faith is not really authentic faith. I'm going to let that hang in the air for a moment. There is a good possibility that some of you within the sound of my voice have been here, perhaps even for decades, or at least you've been in a pew in a church seat for decades, but you don't actually possess a saving faith. For Jesus reminds us that many will cry out, Lord, Lord, in the end. But Jesus will say, away from me, I never knew you. So if your life is characterized by the traits of worldly rather than godly wisdom, and it doesn't even bother you, then I beg you to fall before God today and ask for saving faith. Still others of you, though, you've got an authentic faith, but you struggle nonetheless. We all, remember, James told us last week, stumble in many ways. You know you do. You know that wisdom has not been perfected in you. And be encouraged this morning, my friend, knowing that you are already sanctified in his sight. And while you should dwell securely in that knowledge, you must not rest. We must live a life that strives to be what we already are a life that continues to reach for holiness, a life of continual and never-ending transformation and the image of wisdom that was made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you pray with me?